Hey, it's the Comics Kid 2099, and I'm here for another collection of graphic novels video. But this time, as you can see, I'm talking about Batman. Batman is my more recent love, but it is probably my second greatest love. I grew up with X-Men, and it's only been in the last few years that I've really switched over to Batman. I still read X-Men every now and then, but I feel like with how much I've gotten of Batman in the last few years, this is easily a contender for taking over my love of X-Men. Before I talk about these, I'll talk about what I've got right here. I've got, there's a Pokemon game. These are three Game Boys. Like two Game Boy Colors and a Game Boy Advance. This Game Boy Color is actually my sister's. She doesn't use it and she lets me borrow it. But earlier this year I was playing some Pokemon and I needed two Game Boys and a cable to switch Pokemon from one game to another so that you can catch them all. And I was using her Game Boy because I didn't trust this Game Boy. For some reason, when you put a Game Boy Color game in the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy Advance will stop working every now and then. I can still play Game Boy Advance games on the Game Boy Advance just fine, but playing like this game on that wouldn't work. We got a fairly recent book, Batman Death by Design. I had some requests to pull these out as I talk about them. Uh, you can't tell in the video, but this is textured. Yeah, maybe you can hear that. It's a Elseworlds story. If you don't know what that means, I'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go. Basically, it's a story that the normal Batman doesn't know happened. It's an alternate universe story, and it's self-contained. That's what I love about them. I had a few Batman Elseworlds and just Elseworlds in general before I even cared about these characters period. I've always had a soft spot for Elseworlds in my heart. This story is set in the 1920s when Gotham is becoming more of a city and Batman has to deal with corrupt city planners, stuff like that. It's fun. I really love that it's an original graphic novel instead of, you know, five issues that are then collected in trade like most of these are. If there's an original graphic novel that comes out, I'll buy it. I would much rather throw my money at something like this than a trade paperback that's collecting single issues. And I may do an entire video on that someday. Batman Son of the Demon. This is an oddly shaped book. It's by Mike Barr, who's a really good Batman writer. He's done some great stories. This is the one you've probably heard of. Uh, Batman has a son in this story. And after this book came out, Basically, the editors were like, oh, no, no, that didn't really happen. That was just kind of an imaginary tale. But then, 20 years later, Grant Morrison kind of sort of used this as the basis of his run, uh, except that what happens here did not happen in Grant Morrison's run on Batman. So this is sort of referenced in Kingdom Come. Batman has a son who's a member of the League of Assassins. This, it's had its influence in pop culture, especially with Damian Wayne now being a character for several years. Then we have Night Cries. If you like fun adventure stories or typical Batman stories, you probably won't like Night Cries. It's very depressing. I bought it. I didn't really know what was going to happen in it. The artwork is about as bleak as it is here on the cover. And the subject matter is just not something... It's important subject matter, but... It's not something that I enjoy reading about. Venom. It's been signed by uh, Jose Garcia Lopez. That's his signature right there. I only got this for about 20 bucks and signed. That's a steal. Uh, now that book has been put back into print, I think because of The Dark Knight Rises, they put a lot of Batman books that were out of print back into print. And that's one. And when I got it, it was out of print. So that's an extra awesome. Now, I got this based on a recommendation by Mr. Vince from Geekvolution. Uh, it's hardcover. And I really enjoyed it. It's a fun Batman story. Uh, it was originally a manga, but it's been translated by Max Allen Collins, who is an author and a comic book historian. He's a big fan of Batman. Um, but this guy, Kia Asamiya, or Asamiya, he's a pretty famous Japanese comic book guy. I haven't read anything else that he's done. But this story, it feels very much like a Batman book, and that's what's great about it. It's fairly lengthy. 
and if you like Batman, but you don't necessarily want to dig out, oh, where does this story take place? Does it happen before X, Y, and Z? This is the book for you. It's very much standalone. You don't have to read 25 Batman books before you read it, and that's great. Now, I have The Dark Knight Strikes Again, also in hardcover. Uh, I had read this from the library several years ago. Did not like it, but then I saw this for $10, and for a hardcover, that's really a good deal. Um, it's still bad. There are some things about it that I like. I will go so far as to say that. Many people wouldn't even go there, but there are a few things about it that I like. It's just not the Batman book that really anyone wants to read. And there's this Joker graphic novel. It's, again, it's an original graphic novel, and I think that's great that DC is still willing to take risks on these things when they have no monetary uh, motivation to do that. Uh, the problem with this book is that it is terrible. The character does not feel like the Joker at all. Many of the other characters don't feel like themselves either. Killer Croc doesn't resemble the Killer Croc of the comics. Um, the Penguin, I think they don't even call him Oswald. They call him something else, a different name. It's just a very not good book. Um, but at the time, a lot of people were reading it and rate, you know, saying, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Now, I don't think many people are even aware of it. Maybe I'm just not hearing the right people. This book is called Dark Dynasty. It's also a hardcover. I believe that's the last of my hardcovers until I get to another shelf. This story, it's actually three short stories, each starring a different Batman from a different uh, generation, hence the name Dynasty. This is okay. I think it's a good concept. It's just not executed well. And I'd like to do a video on that book someday, too. Okay, we've got year one. This is... You'll notice with the X-Men collection, I had them all chronologically um, in order of how they were published. But here, I don't have it like that. Uh, it would take me way too long to do that with the Batman books. So I just kind of have them grouped however I want to have them grouped. So like I've got a couple of Frank Miller books here next to each other. And then like Year Two and Shaman, those are set very early in Batman's career. But then some of these are just kind of set wherever I've put them. So then we have year one. Um, if you don't read Batman, but you've seen the movies recently, uh, this story is where Batman Begins is loosely based on. This story is different from Batman Begins. I don't really like it when people say, oh, Batman Begins is based on year one. It's not really. There's one scene in this book that pretty effortlessly is used in Batman Begins, but other than that, uh, Batman isn't even the main character of this story. It's Jim Gordon's story, and I don't hate that. I think it's interesting. For one book, uh, Batman is the main character of all these books, so I've, he I've seen people complain that Batman's not heavily featured here. I don't really care. Uh, I think it's a good story. I came to really appreciate Jim Gordon as a character here, and it has had its influence on the Batman books for 30 years. I think this came out in 86, maybe. Now, actually, Year One was Frank Miller's second Batman story. His first was The Dark Knight Returns, which is, some people say it's the greatest Batman graphic novel of all time. I don't know if I think that. It's definitely a wonderful story. I just don't know if it's the best for me. Um, if it's not the best, I don't know what is the best. The plot of this is loosely adapted into The Dark Knight Rises, in that both stories have Batman retired for a, sing a significant amount of time and then returning to the job. Um, that's about where the similarities end. Well, there's, there's some more, but I won't get into that here. Um, both of those are by Frank Miller. Um, if you only read two or three Batman books, Definitely, Year One and Dark Knight Returns need to be among those. Some people like to see it as the Alpha and the Omega. You know, read this one first and then read this sort of as a bookend of all of Batman's adventures. I think another interesting way to read it is to read the Dark Knight Returns first. And instead of reading it as the pre-sequel to Batman Year One and all of these stories, instead, look at the Dark Knight Returns as 
the final story of the Silver Age Batman. I think that's really how it should be read, considering Dark Knight Returns came out first. It was Frank Miller's first Batman story, came out before year one, came out before all this. I like to read it as the the last hoorah of the Silver Age Batman. I think that's something that maybe not many people do and something interesting you should look into if you're a fan of those stories. And we have year two. This story, see, he's holding a gun. Um, I don't hate it, but it's just not very good. Uh, I think part of the problem is that uh, Mike Barr, wow, the same guy who did Son of the Demon, Mike Barr was writing this and composing this around the same time that Year One was coming out. This was happening in Detective Comics while Year One was happening in Batman. And I've heard that this was based on a pitch that Barr had put forward about five years earlier before Crisis on Infinite Earths. And at the time, trying to streamline a character's uh, previous origins and continuity and such wasn't nearly as popular as it was after Crisis on Infinite Earths when you had Batman Year One make that really popular. So it was based on a previously existing story idea, and so much of what happens here is later rendered uh, moot by later stories. Uh, Gordon is already a commissioner just a few months after he was promoted to, I think, sergeant in Year One. So it makes very little sense. Gordon looks at least 15 years older in Batman's second year than he did in his first year. It's still a fun story, but you have to read it thinking that this is something that doesn't happen to Batman. Almost nothing here has carried over into the rest of the Batman chronology. This is Shaman. I really like this story. Um, it's set before and during year one. Part of it is set before Bruce's return to Gotham, and the rest of it is set during Year One, because Year One is such a short story, and yet the events in it span about 11 months. There are a lot of gaps in that calendar where other stories take place, and this is one of them. And it specifically says that it takes place during Year One because he mentions some of the events that just recently happened to him in Year One. This is an older trade, you can tell because it's by Warner Books instead of just being put out by DC. That one cost me a little bit more than I usually will pay for a graphic novel, but I had it, I got it with a coupon along with several other books that we'll be talking about soon. Arkham Asylum Living Hell. This is one of the Batman books that I had before I actually became a Batman fan. As I mentioned earlier, I've only really become a Batman fan thanks to the Dark Knight movie and various YouTubers who would then talk about Batman's history and it just sounded really interesting to me. And I should say, I grew up watching the animated series with Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, but I never really considered myself a Batman fan. I just had the basics. I had this book, I had Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison, I had The Long Halloween, and then I had Dark Knight Returns and Year One, and that was basically it for me. It wasn't until after the Dark Knight Returns that I started really getting into Batman and getting all this other stuff. Living Hell is also one of Dan Slott's only DC stories, and this is another one that it can really take place anywhere in Batman's timeline. So if you're looking for something that just a quick and easy read, uh, you don't need a lot of history on Batman, this is the book for you. Uh, especially, Batman doesn't really appear in this a whole lot. This mainly focuses on some of the inmates in Arkham Asylum, and it builds a few new characters. I really like it for that. Those new characters, I love them. Um, highly underrated book. I wish more people read that book and enjoyed it. Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison and Dave McKean. This is one of those books, if you look up top five Batman stories of all time, this one usually shows up on many of the lists. Despite my undying love for Grant Morrison and his works, I don't really feel like this book holds up. There are just a couple of little things here that I think really work, and even then, most of them only in the context of this story. When you look at Batman as an ongoing character, there are a couple of things here that definitely don't work. Definitely an overblown, overrated story in my opinion. 
Uh, it's enjoyable, but it's not the be-all, end-all of Arkham Asylum stories. Like I say, I think Living Hell vastly is superior to Arkham Asylum, Serious House on a Serious Earth. Then there's Arkham Reborn, which is the most continuity heavy of the Arkham books that I have. The only Arkham book I'm missing is Madness by Sam Keith. But this one right here is kind of tied into around that time when Dick Grayson was Batman after Final Crisis. Um, I haven't read Final Crisis or any of the Battle for the Cal stuff, but this is actually a really enjoyable book. I think it uh, does a good job of getting into the head of one of the characters here. It adds some new dynamics to a couple of the characters in the Asylum itself, and I thought it was highly enjoyable. I didn't think it was going to be that good when I read it, but it surprised me. Faces is by Matt Wagner. Now, Wagner is a favorite of mine just because he created Grindel. Grindel being an independent character that I like a whole lot. Um, he's done a couple of other Batman stories. One of them I have and one of them I don't. Uh, I'm Once I get the other one, then I'll put those up here. And this is probably the least known of his Batman work. It's got Two-Face in it. And I'm finding out when I read these Two-Face, I would consider to be Batman's second most prominent villain, but he doesn't have a lot of good stories. In fact, a lot of his stories revolve around him getting scarred or getting cured and then getting scarred again. Um, this one isn't like that, but at the same time, I don't think it's an especially fantastic story. Fortunate Son, this is one of the worst Batman stories ever. Long story short, I'm, I'm going to spoil it because I don't want anyone to read this. Uh, it has Elvis's twin brother is trying to create a new Elvis for the next generation so that he can kill this guy and then make money on the profits because Elvis's twin brother apparently became a manager for musicians, up-and-coming musicians. It's astoundingly terrible and instantly dated because... This guy, you know, 20 years from now, you won't be able to read this without thinking, oh, okay, Elvis's twin brother is in his 90s. Now, it doesn't actually say anything about Elvis, but it says things like the king of rock and roll, and it is highly implied that it is Elvis's twin brother. Horrible story. Don't bother if you see it anywhere. It's not worth picking up. The Long Halloween, this is one of the longest stories on a shelf. Everyone lists this as one of the most fantastic stories of all time. I will say that the art is wonderful, but the storytelling is very typical of Jeff Loeb. Jeff Loeb is the internet's comic book whipping boy. Anything that he's written, people will relentlessly make fun of it, and quite often with good reason. I don't feel like this book is any better than, say, Challengers of the Unknown, maybe. Uh, it's supposed to be this really deep mystery story, Batman, as a detective, does not do any detective work at all. The most he does is he sits around a table looking at clues, arriving at no conclusions, and then anytime he's close to a dead end or something, he'll just go and chase Catwoman. It's really overblown. I don't feel like this story had to take place over the span of a year. You have some stories like year one, it took place over a year, but then it took out all the boring parts because you don't really want to see an entire year of Batman doing something with one case. And that's what this is. And so a lot of it is filler. You'll see Joker doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with the story except tangentially. And so it's really just a lot of filler involving a lot of Batman's rogues. It's definitely one of the most overrated stories I've ever read. And if you are upset that I have insulted your favorite Batman story, well, put in the comments and maybe I can do a full video on it where I explain in detail why it is so overrated. And then Dark Victory, um, basically the exact same story as The Long Halloween. It follows the same pattern. It takes place over a year. Um, all of the main crimes happen on a holiday. The only difference is that Robin is in this story and you get to see his origin from a modern perspective. 
I don't think there's a lot of people really clamoring for this story like there are with Long Halloween, so I don't have to tell you not to bother with it. Since it's not so critically acclaimed, It's I don't feel like I have to jump down its throat like I do with Long Halloween. Uh, if I was to say, I'd say it's probably on par with Long Halloween. And then my favorite of Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's Batman work is Haunted Night. It's my favorite because this one doesn't even bother being a big epic story like those other two. This is just an anthology of stories that have involved Batman on Halloween. Three stories, either all on the same night or a couple of different Halloweens. I think at least two of the stories, it's very possible that they take place on the same night at different times. I think it's really fun, a really enjoyable book. It's another one of those where you don't actually need a lot of knowledge about Batman to enjoy it. And I feel like it's very much underrated, especially when people like to give so many props to Long Halloween and another book written by Jeff Loeb that I'll talk about later. Right now, in fact. Hush. This is the action movie of Batman. It involves Batman traveling all across the world trying to defeat this bad guy named Hush. Here's a better look at him with the bandages and stuff. The good thing about this is that there aren't as many people trying to tell you that it's good when it's really not, uh, like The Long Halloween. This book is just bad. It's got a lot of stuff that feels forced. There's no real reason why half the things in here even need to happen. It's basically just a really uh, pumped up, let's get all of Batman's rogues and try and force them into one story when over half of them have no reason to be in this story. It's not that good. I've read better Hush stories, but this is not one of them. Hush Returns is in the contending for one of the worst Batman stories that I have ever read. This gets everything wrong. It has Prometheus in it, Prometheus from Grant Morrison's Justice League run, and in my opinion, Prometheus went from being this guy who almost took down the League, and the only reason he failed was a contingency he didn't plan for, to being this useless guy who gets shot by Green Arrow alone. It makes so very little sense. This involves the Joker's origin story, and if you've read The Killing Joke, you know that at the end of the story, the Joker tells Batman that he doesn't really remember how he got to the way he is. And he says, if I have to have an origin story, let it be multiple choice. This story spits all over that. The Joker does remember everything that happened in The Killing Joke, and to me, that is just a crying shame. This story, if I had to choose one single Batman story to say that it did not happen, Hush Returns would be it. That's horrible, horrible, horrible story. As the Crow Flies, this is um, a mystery story. It involves the Penguin, uh, it involves Jonathan Crane, I like four-fifths of this story. It's the last issue where everything just feels like it's trying to wrap up really quickly, and I don't think it... It should have taken maybe a couple more issues to wrap itself up, but it ends really sloppily, but the rest of it I find is really good. Um, definitely an underrated one. This is another one that I got with some gift cards that I got for Christmas one year. So far, the other one was Shaman. And actually, Hush was one of them. Stories that I didn't want to pay all that money for, but with gift cards, I had no problem with it. Now, both volumes of Under the Hood, also written by Judd Winnick, who did this uh, as the crow flies. Under the Hood is now collected under one volume. And someday, maybe, if I find it kind of not so expensive, I'd like to get the single volume just because I really hate it when a single story is divided up into multiple volumes. Hush is like that, All-Star Superman is like that, and Under the Hood is like that. If I can find one volume collecting both of these trades, I will get it because I'd rather have all of the story in one book. That's just how I am. If you want to know about how Jason Todd became a villain, go watch the animated movie Under the Red Hood. It's pretty much superior to this in almost every way. This is one of those stories that's got a lot of elements to it that are just extraneous and aren't really needed at all. 
The movie does a really good job of streamlining a lot of that and actually giving a decent reason why he's back to being alive after being killed in an earlier story from about 20 years earlier. There's uh, Batman Snow. This is one of the later Legends of the Dark Knight stories. You have some stories like Venom or Shaman. Those are very early Legends of the Dark Knight stories from the late 80s, early 90s. This was like mid to late 90s, and it's not really that good. Well, Mr. Freeze is in it. A, I've never liked Mr. Freeze, and B, his origin here is just kind of weird. They write him as a guy who hears voices in his head, and that's just really strange to me. But the rest of the book I actually really enjoy. Um, this shows if Batman finds out that he can't always rely on Harvey Dent and Jim Gordon because both of those men work inside the law, then he uh, tries to find a way where he can have allies who are not constricted by the law. And it's basically when he finds out that he can't always rely on those gentlemen, he doesn't immediately say, I'll go get a kid who's going to be my partner. This shows the mentality of why Batman would immediately think that uh, an orphan child would make a good sidekick. It's a really good story. I think they could rework it a little bit, add in some new elements. This could make for a good Batman reboot movie. If they were to, whenever they do the Batman reboot movie, I think this could be a good pre-Robin origin story if they combined it with parts of Dark Victory, maybe. It's not bad, but it's just not terrific. Then we have one of the most underrated Batman stories, Turning Points. This is great. This follows the relationship between Jim Gordon and Batman over the span of Batman's career. So the first issue takes place just a month or less than after year one. And then there's an issue that takes place shortly after Robin joins Batman. There's an issue that takes place shortly after Batgirl was crippled. It's really good. This is another one that I bought it because I saw it cheap somewhere and I was getting lots of Batman stuff. I had no idea that it was so good. And I don't hear anyone praising this book. It's definitely underrated. Then we have the Batman, the Cat and the Bat. This is another one that Batman is not a very huge part of. It's actually Batgirl and her first meeting with Catwoman. And Kevin McGuire, who did some of the 1980s JLI stuff, his art is really good. This is a pretty funny slash uh, interesting book. It's mostly playing up kind of a more lighthearted story, but it's got some elements in it that you can take seriously. I enjoyed it. It's really fun. If you like Batgirl, get this book. Tales of the Demon. This is... The first, oh, I want to say this is about 10 years of various Ra's al Ghul stories. From his earliest appearances, where he's actually not even in the issue, it's just his influence on Batman, for, I think, 10 years. I'm not going to pull it out and look at the table of contents, but these are some magnificent comic books. First of all, it's pre-crisis. This stuff starts at about 1969. And goes up to, I guess, 79. And usually, when I think of pre-crisis Batman, I think of, like, the one with the rainbow-colored costume or the short ears, and he's always joking and punching an alien in the face. This is not like that. This is Batman being dark and broody before Frank Miller. Uh, 15 years before Frank Miller. Definitely, if you're into the modern Batman and you're thinking, oh, this is old, I don't want that get it it's it's really good now this is called scarecrow tales i'm not especially a scarecrow fan i don't hate him but i don't consider myself a fan of his and this is a lot like the tales of the demon except that it goes from the 40s all the way to the 2000s so you get a wide variety of stories here uh, some very early golden age stories and you're thinking okay that's very quaint and then you get some other stories that are more modern and they're a little bit better told if you like Scarecrow, obviously you need to get this. Uh, I am going to stop right here because I have been recording for about 30 minutes. I had no idea I was going to talk this long about Batman. Um, I will definitely do more Batman videos. I've got uh, about twice as much here that I'm going to talk about. So 
Until then, uh, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.